All right. Well, uh, thinking a little bit about church history, both um, historically and biblically, uh, Christians have understood that Jesus is one person with two natures. And uh, Jesus is one person who is both fully human and fully divine. And yet during the early days of Christianity, uh, various heresies arose in the church uh, on this point. Uh, there was a heresy known as Nestorianism. Uh, Nestorianism taught that Jesus existed as two persons rather than one person. Um, Arianism taught that Jesus was fully human, but that he was merely human. So Je Jehovah's Witnesses today hold to a form of Arianism. They believe that God was uh, man, but not that Jesus was God. Uh, Docetism taught that Jesus was fully God, but that he was not fully man. He only appeared to be a man. Uh, there was a heresy known as Apollinarianism, which posited that Jesus had a human body, but he didn't possess a human mind or a human spirit. So he wasn't fully human. Uh, Eutychianism claimed that Jesus had one nature, which was a new nature. It was sort of a combination of the human and the divine, so that Jesus was a, a demigod of sorts. And, and so there are all of these heretical views that came about from denying some element, some essential element of the idea that Jesus is one person who is both fully God and fully man. And uh, of course, if you are a Christian, you should understand that uh, Jesus is one person with two natures. You should understand that Jesus, on the one hand, is the eternal and unchanging and almighty God, the second person of the Trinity, uh, but he is also fully man. He possesses a human body, a human mind, a human heart, human emotions, a human consciousness, and a human spirit. He is fully human. Uh, again, if you're a Christian, by God's grace, you understand that. And yet, I think that sometimes Christians in conservative circles, um, maybe from a practical perspective, might err in the direction of the docetic uh, heresy. Again, a uh, Docetism taught that Jesus was fully God, but that he was not fully human. And, and none of us would probably come out and just say that. Um, but at, by the same token, is it possible that we might overemphasize Christ's deity in such a way that it compro compromises the fullness of his humanity? Uh, is it possible that we might pr prioritize the spiritual over the material, or that we might inadvertently downplay the suffering of Christ, or the temptation of Christ, or uh, any of the human experience of Christ by overemphasizing his deity. And so if that's the case, or if that is a temptation, our text for this morning provides us with some needed correction. So let's turn in our Bibles to... Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, this morning we will be looking at verses 7 through 10, Hebrews 5 verses 7 through 10. Uh, I've mentioned a number of times that the original readers of the book of Hebrews were being tempted to abandon the Christian faith in order to return to Judaism. And uh, the book of Hebrews was written in order to warn these readers not to do that, not to go back to Judaism. Uh, because ultimately, Jesus is better. He's a better prophet. He offers a better sacrifice. He is a uh, superior high priest, and he more fully reveals God. And uh, over the last several weeks, we've focused on Jesus as the superior high priest. Uh, Jesus is a superior high priest. He's a superior mediator between God and man because he has passed through the heavens, because he was tempted in every way, even as we are tempted, yet without sin. Uh, he's a superior high priest because he was appointed by the Father to a superior priesthood, the Melchizedekian priesthood, which we talked about last week. And, and so those are some of the ways that the author makes the case that Jesus is a superior high priest, 
This morning, the author is going to continue along these lines, and he's going to focus specifically on the way that Christ's faithfulness as a man, as a human being, uh, contributes to the idea that he is a greater high priest. So look with me at Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. The author writes this. He says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, um, again, the, the context is one where the author is arguing that Jesus is a greater high priest. And uh, one of the reasons that Jesus is a greater high priest is verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. So in the days of his flesh, which is to say that when Jesus came into the world, when he walked upon the earth and lived out his earthly life, uh, at that time, in the days of his flesh, it says, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. And uh, that, that might be a reference to the experience of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, but it's probably um, a more general uh, statement concerning the earnest, earnestness and intensity of the prayer life of Jesus throughout his earthly life. Uh, because, of course, intercession is a critical part of the priestly role. A part of the role of the high priest was to seek the Lord's favor on behalf of the Lord's people. And here in verse 7, Jesus was not only faithful in prayer, Jesus was successful in prayer. It says that he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, and it says at the end of verse 7, he was heard because of his reverence. So, you know, you can imagine you have a student who faithfully does his homework uh, every night, but then he fails every assignment, right? That wouldn't be good. Or if you have a gardener who is faithful in the sense that he waters all of the plants in the garden every day, but then all of the plants die because he overwaters them, uh, that's not good either. Or if you have an athlete who faithfully attends every practice, but then loses every game and never improves his game, uh, something is obviously wrong. And uh, theoretically, you could have someone who was faithful in prayer, someone who uh, went and did the act of prayer uh, consistently, but whose prayers were never heard. And uh, the point here is that Jesus isn't like that. He is not only faithful in prayer, he is successful in prayer. The Father hears him because of his reverence. Now, uh, we should note that just because Jesus was heard doesn't necessarily mean that his prayers were always answered in the way that he might have requested. Of course, the primary example of that is Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he um, asks and, and prays that if it was possible that the cup of suffer, suffering might pass from him. Uh, obviously, that prayer was heard, but at the same time, the cup wasn't removed, right? Jesus uh, prayed that the cup would uh, be removed, but he also prayed that the cup would only be removed if it was possible, and uh, it was not possible. And moreover, Jesus also prayed, thy will be done, right? And ultimately, the Father's will was fully accomplished. So, so all of this demonstrates Christ's full submission to the Father's plan, and it demonstrates that his prayers were heard. Uh, again, the text says that Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Uh, that's the English Standard Version. I think that's a good translation. Uh, other translations put it a little differently. The New American Standard says that he was heard because of his piety. Uh, the Net Bible says that he was heard because of his devotion. And so I think as we uh, think about these different translations. The, the English word reverence suggests that Jesus was heard because of the reverence that he had for the Father. Uh, the King James uses the word fear, which is the same idea. 
Uh, the word piety or devotion in the NASB and the Net Bible, respectively, uh, that connotes a more general sort of faithfulness and obedience. Uh, and so it suggests that Jesus was heard because of his faithfulness and his obedience throughout his earthly life. And, uh, and so if Jesus is heard because of his reverence for the Father, as, the, as in the ESV, then that might seem to emphasize who the Father is, because it suggests that uh, Jesus was heard because he acknowledged the worthiness of the Father. Right? And so there's an emphasis on who the Father is. Uh, but if Jesus was heard because of his piety, then that might emphasize who Jesus is as the one who is worthy by virtue of his piety. And so is it that the worthiness of the Father is emphasized, or is it that the worthiness of the Son is emphasized? And I think the answer is that both things can be true at once, right? These ideas are not mutually exclusive. And when Jesus has reverence for the Father, it suggests both that the Father is worthy of that reverence, that he is to be revered, and that Christ is worthy because he expresses that reverence for the Father. There is a mutual adoration that exists between the Father and the Son, and the Father responds to Jesus because of the adoration that Jesus has for the Father and because of the adoration that the Father has for the Son. So there is mutual adoration. And so the, the point of verse 7 is that Jesus is a greater high priest because when he offers up prayers and supplications with loud cries, the Father hears him because of the reverence that Christ has for the Father. Uh, Jesus loves the Father, he reveres the Father, he obeys the Father, and therefore when he cries out to the Father, the Father hears those cries, he hears those supplications, and therefore Jesus is a greater high priest. Right? Jesus is the high priest whose prayers are heard because ultimately Jesus is without sin. And uh, consequently, he is superior to the earthly high priest whose record was tarnished by his own personal sin. Uh, the prayers and the petitions of Jesus are made with complete obedience and complete reverence so that when Christ intercedes on our behalf, his prayers are completely unmarred by personal sin or failure. Uh, the earthly high priest had to continually offer sacrifices for his own sin. Uh, Jesus offered himself once for all as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of his people. And his prayers are always heard because of his reverence for the Father. So that's the first reason that Jesus is a greater high priest in our text for this morning. Secondly, Jesus is a greater high priest because in verse 8, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So uh, Jesus is the Son of God, and when the author of the book of Hebrews talks about the sonship of Christ, he's talking about his divine sonship. Uh, we've actually already seen this in several places in the book of Hebrews. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, the author says that in these last days, the Father has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And the author uh, continues, about, uh, speaking about the Son, he says that the Son is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So uh, there, Christ's sonship is very, very clearly connected to his deity. Um, likewise, in Hebrews 1, verse 8, the author quotes Psalm 45, Speaking of God the Father, it says, but of the Son, he says, so concerning the Son, the Father says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, and uh, time and again, the, when the author of the book of Hebrews mentions the sonship of Christ, he is emphasizing his, his deity, uh, Christ as God. And so here, when the author says that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered, although he was a son, it means that although Jesus was the divine son of God, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. He didn't override his humanity uh, with his deity in order to obey. Uh, Jesus obeyed in his humanity. Uh, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, 
uh, but rather one who was tempted in every way as we are uh, yet without sin. And when uh, Christ took upon himself the human nature and he entered into this fallen world, he experienced uh, all that comes with the, the temptation and the difficulty of living in a fallen world. Uh, he experienced hunger. He grieved over the loss of Lazarus. He re experienced rejection and betrayal and abandonment and the pain of the uh, scourging and the crucifixion. And uh, although... I, I think the, the suffering that the author of the book of Hebrews describes here probably refers more generally to the suffering, suffering that Jesus experienced throughout his earthly life. I also think that the death and crucifixion of Christ are particularly in view because um, the, the author of the book of Hebrews repeatedly focuses on the centrality of Christ's sacrifice and the context here is of Christ's role as a superior high priest. And of course, a part of serving as the high priest involves offering uh, sacrifice. And part of being the superior high priest for Jesus is that he offers the superior sacrifice that he offers. Uh, and so Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. And that is particularly true of what Christ learned through his suffering and death on the cross, where he experienced the greatest and most intense suffering of his life. And uh, although Jesus was the divine son, although he was God incarnate, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He didn't override his suffering with his divine nature or, uh, you know, tap into the supernatural power so that he could obey when he wouldn't have otherwise obeyed in his humanity. Now, you know, it might seem sort of strange to think about Jesus as learning things, Right? because he is the Son of God, and if Jesus is God, and if God is all-knowing, then how can Jesus learn anything? Uh, but again, this type of thinking seems to neglect the fullness of Christ's humanity. Uh, this type of thinking seems to emphasize his deity to the exclusion of his humanity. Uh, but according to the author of the book of Hebrews, Jesus was fully human, and this means that he developed and he learned and he grew in wisdom as a human. As uh, a man, Jesus learned what it meant to obey under human conditions. And he learned what it meant to obey God in the midst of suffering. And as Jesus learned obedience, he obeyed the Father uh, to the full, not by virtue of his deity, but in his humanity. Uh, which also means that when Jesus learned obedience, it wasn't as though he was disobedient and that he needed to learn how to be obedient, right? That's not what the author is talking about. Uh, the author has already made it clear that Jesus was without sin, and that's one of the things that makes him a superior high priest. The earthly high, high priest had to offer sacrifices for his own sins, but Jesus is a superior high priest because he is without sin. And so again, it's not that Jesus was disobedient and that he learned how to be obedient through suffering. Rather, as he grew and developed as a human being, he learned what it meant to obey God as a human being. Uh, not because he disobeyed, uh, because Jesus never disobeyed. Uh, Jesus learned what it meant to obey God as a human being through suffering, and he carried out that obedience in every respect and at every point. And therefore, Jesus is a greater high priest. He's a greater high priest because he learned obedience through suffering. He learned obedience and was faithful through suffering. And that brings us to verse 9, which says, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is a greater high priest because being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. Now, uh, what exactly does the author mean when he says being made perfect? Uh, was Jesus at some point less than perfect or imperfect so that eventually he had to be made perfect? Uh, the, the Greek word here translated perfect has connotation. Sometimes it's translated as mature, sometimes it's translated as complete, and, and, and it has the connotations of something being made complete. And in fact, um, again, it's translated that way sometimes. So the, the idea here isn't 
that Jesus is imperfect, but that he's moving towards perfection over time until he eventually becomes uh, morally perfect. The idea is that Jesus completed his obedience and was made perfect by the fact that he perfectly obeyed to the end of his life and thus completed his life with that perfect record. It's not that he was morally imperfect and needed to be improved. Rather, through his earthly life and especially through his suffering and death, he fully accomplished his mission and was thus made perfect as the one who completed that mission, right? His uh, obedience, he was obedient unto death, and he completed his role as our eternal high priest. And then being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. Uh, of course, the final leg of Christ's redemptive work, uh, the, the final leg of Christ's suffering was the cross, and although he had done nothing wrong, although he had committed no sin, Jesus died on the cross to take the curse that we deserved upon himself so that we could be forgiven. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins if our faith is in him. He paid the penalty that we deserve. He took the punishment that should have fallen upon us. And in that way, he secured our forgiveness uh, or as the author of the book of Hebrews says here, he became the source of eternal salvation. Right? Jesus is the source of our salvation. There's nothing that we can do. There's no prayer that we can say. There's no ritual that we can perform. There's no good uh, deed that we can accomplish that will ever overcome the debt of judgment that we have incurred. Uh, we were talking in the men's Sunday school class today about how if you have someone who appears before a judge and this person is guilty of murder, uh, even if the person appeals to the judge and says, says you know, judge, uh, I've done all of these good things and I never lied about anything and I never lusted after a woman and I did this right and I did that right, the person's still guilty of murder, right? And the person still deserves to be punished for the murder. And if the judge was to allow such a person to go free, then that would be a corrupt and unjust judge, right? Uh, the Lord is not a corrupt and unjust judge. Um, but when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins so that if our faith is in him, we have forgiveness. He has, in effect, paid our fine. And uh, we have newness of life through his resurrection, and we begin to walk in obedience to his commands, which is why it says that he became the source of salvation uh, specifically for all who obey. Uh, it's not that we get the salvation because of our obedience, right? You could read it that way. He became the source of salvation for all who obey, so that if you obey, then you'll get the salvation, right? Uh, that's not what it means. Uh, rather, the salvation comes to people who obey because the supernatural work of God in salvation changes a person in such a way that that person begins to live in obedience. And so, you know, the, the biblical analogy of this is the, the plant that bears fruit. And when a seed is planted and it sprouts, uh, it will eventually produce leaves and fruit. Uh, but it doesn't sprout because it produces fruit, right? The sprouting comes prior to the fruit. It produces fruit because it sprouts. And uh, so too with our salvation, we don't experience salvation because we do good works. Uh, God doesn't save us because we bear fruit. Rather, we bear fruit because he saves us. And in the same way that God is the source of growth for every plant that bears fruit, Jesus is the source of salvation for those who obey. Uh, the Lord doesn't cause plants to grow because they produce fruit, right? He causes plants to grow with the result that they produce fruit. And uh, similarly, Jesus is not the source of salvation for us because we obey. We obey because Jesus is the source of our salvation. And uh, he's the source of salvation because at the end of the verse, it says that he was designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, I talked about what it means that Christ was a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek last week, uh, but essentially the Melchizedekian priesthood is a superior priesthood. So you can uh, refer to last week's 
sermon. If you uh, weren't here last week, we have it, I think, up on YouTube. Uh, But the point of this passage is that Jesus is a greater high priest because he was faithful in prayer, he was faithful to learn obedience through suffering, and he was faithful to complete the work of redemption on behalf of his people. And he has therefore become the source of salvation for those who live in obedience to him. Uh, All of this was because uh, this was the plan from all eternity, right? Jesus is the source of eternal salvation because he was designated to this superior priesthood by the Father. And that's why the Father sent him into the world. And therefore, let us hold fast to our confession. Let us persevere to the end, knowing that Jesus is a superior high priest who secured our salvation, uh, not because of anything that we did, but because he was designated to serve as our eternal high priest by the Father. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth that we have a high priest upon whom we can rely Uh, a high priest who has um, been made perfect through his sinless life, who has accomplished our salvation from beginning to end if our faith is in him. Uh, We pray that you would help us as a result of that salvation to walk in obedience, to uh, hold fast to the word of truth, and to be faithful to the message that you've entrusted to us. And as we uh, turn our attention to the Lord's Supper, um, help us to to see in it the gospel that is proclaimed in it, to be nourished by that gospel, and to be empowered to live new lives uh, through that gospel. And we pray these things all in Christ's name.